Welcome to TVBS Meeting Room, where we tackle global issues with a view from Taiwan. I'm your host, Wen Chi Yu. The Council on Foreign Relations recently released a task force report on U.S.-Taiwan relations in a new era. Today, we're honored to have the task force co-chair, Emerald Michael Mullen. He's a former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest ranking military officer and advisor to the U.S. president from 2007 to 2011. Welcome, Emerald. Uh, good to be with you, Winch. I want to begin by saying uh, I wish we had a lot more time to talk about your incredible four decades of military service, uh, from Thanks. the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to the killing of Osama bin Laden. But today, we're going to focus on Taiwan, U.S., and the Indo-Pacific region, um, a growing challenge with a more assertive China. The CFR report assumes the status quo across the Taiwan Strait is unsustainable, primarily because of Xi Jinping's desire to take over Taiwan. And China says the opposite. It says it is the U.S. and Taiwan that are changing the status quo. How do you respond to that? I think that's the essence of the challenge right now. In many ways, we're just talking by each other. And that's what uh, part of what we hope this report would do would stimulate uh, an engagement across a host of issues inside this very, very complex issue that is Taiwan. Um, and uh, you mentioned my service. You know, I've actually spent quite a bit of time in the Pacific, uh, but I, and I was, I was, I visited Taiwan in March of last year. Uh, it's the first time I'd been there since 1970. Um, and when I was in the chairman's job from 2007 to 11. You know, I didn't spend any time on Taiwan. It wasn't that it wasn't a significant issue. It just wasn't on the plate because we had the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and a pretty significant terrorist threat, as you've indicated. Uh, that said, I believe now it's it is the center mass, if you will, the most significant issue between the U.S. Uh, and, and China. And I think that relationship is the most important relationship uh, in this century. And I think it will continue to be driven mostly by the fact that these are the two largest economies in the world. Uh, and uh, and it appears, because we're talking past each other, to be getting worse and worse. And Taiwan is at the center of that. That's one of the reasons I agreed to co-chair this task force, so I could so I could understand the issue in much more detail, which I think I do now, understand its, its incredible complexity, uh, and try to depict in the report where we are and the danger that is there if the two leaders in these countries uh, don't uh, engage each other in a way to settle this out in a peaceful way. Well, I think, as you said, uh, status quo is at the essence of the issue, right? In China's mind, the status quo is temporary and has to lead to unification. Uh, however, as we know, peaceful unification seems less likely day by day so if the status quo becomes a permanent separation, however you call it, and if the People's Liberation Army continues to grow its capabilities, do you think China will make the military move? At some point in time, uh, I, I suspect they will. Um, certainly with this leader, different from his predecessors, this leader being Xi Jinping, has made it pretty clear uh, that we cannot continue uh, specifically along the lines of where we've been. And China has been much more aggressive, actually, in every sphere. The, the military moves get an awful lot of publicity, but China has been very aggressive and active in isolating Taiwan economically, diplomatically, politically, as well as militarily. The military operations are much more aggressive. It was my view when I visited Taiwan, and I still, even after studying this now for many months, is China has, in its coercive actions, has really imbalanced uh, the area and the region. And, and we need to get back to a more balanced perspective. I think it's really important uh, to emphasize from the U.S. perspective uh, that the one China policy is still the policy. Uh, mm -hmm. the, whole, the, the whole goal of this is to, to see China and Taiwan uh, reconcile uh, this issue and do it in a peaceful way. Our president, President Biden, has been pretty clear, uh, uh, even uh, though his words have been pulled back, that he's going to be there to support Taiwan. Uh, president Xi has been pretty clear in his words to get the get the get his military ready by 2027. 
Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, this can no longer be passed on to his relief. He needs it to achieve the quote unquote Chinese uh, rejuvenation. And, and I think we underestimate the significance, particularly we in America, underestimate the significance of history here. China went through a very bad time uh, uh, over 100 years ago. And this is almost, to listen to Xi Jinping, this is almost the last piece of the puzzle, if you will, to rectify that very, very bad time. So all that's very serious, those are very serious concerns that Xi Jinping and other Chinese leaders uh, have focused on. Uh, the, the main focus from our perspective is whatever the resolution, it needs to be done peacefully. Mm. One other point that, that is really significant uh, is the context, and, and I hope people will read this report, because the context has changed so much over the last 50 or 60 years. And, and that, in, including the, the idea that independence is important for the Taiwanese people, that democracy is important uh, yes. for the Taiwanese people, that, that Taiwan is a booming economy centered on the semiconductor industry, uh, not just for Taiwan or for China or the U.S., but for the world. So lots of things have changed from when this policy was originally put in place, which makes it that much more critical that the, this, that these issues be resolved peacefully. Well, I'm glad that you said the context has changed so much, right? Uh, we know uh, the the sort of cornerstone of uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations uh, is really based on the Taiwan Relations Act, which was, you know, almost 40 years ago, or actually more than 40 years ago. Right. And so uh, China has changed a lot. Taiwan has changed a lot. The U.S. has changed a lot. Um, and so, you know, certainly I think all sides are right to say uh, the other sides are not sticking to the principles uh, that were agreed upon uh, four decades ago or even later. Now, the Chinese ambassador Xie Feng said during his uh, interview at Aspen Security Forum just a few days ago that Taiwan is a non-negotiable issue. Uh, quote, unquote, he says, it's like a gray rhino charging at us. Um, he meant the U.S.-Taiwan uh, policy, and he expressed his concern about how much pro-separatist rhetoric from some Taiwanese leaders was influencing American leaders. Here we see again, China is framing Taiwan as advocating for separation or independence. Um, to be honest, this is a very likely to be the justification for any Chinese military move toward Taiwan. And so if China perceives support for Taiwan's status quo as support for Taiwan's permanent separation or even independence, what else can be done to secure Taiwan? Are we just buying time? Well, I, I, I believe for some time, long before this report, actually, that if uh, any Chinese leader, including this one, Xi Jinping thought Taiwan would either declare independence or would be independent, that they would take military action to make sure that didn't happen. And I think that will continue to be the case. Based on my trip out there a year ago, March, I was reminded, because I hadn't been there in so long, there's a lot of politics in Taiwan as well. Right. And President Tsai Ing-wen uh, of the DPP has certainly leaned in the direction, the independent direction, uh, for Taiwan. There is an election in January, and the current leader uh, in terms of the DPP, is, uh, uh, Vice President Lai, has been pretty vocal uh, about you know moving in the independence direction as well. He hasn't declared it, but he's moved in that direction. And it, it really is important for Tsai Ing-wen, as well as Lai, to be very careful about yeah. their about their rhetoric, because it's a very dangerous situation and it could trip it. Uh, again, uh, we haven't and shouldn't be, we the US have not been involved in, in Taiwanese elections and who gets elected. That really is up to the Taiwanese people and that's really what democracy uh, is all about. So any leader, whether, whether it's uh, you know from the KMT or, uh, or from the DPP, has they, every leader has to be very careful uh, about the rhetoric, clearly given the situation and the level of, of intensity that we're in right now, it, which could be very dangerous. One of the really substantive parts of the report uh, that you've talked about and that I that co chaired this task force is that we really believed in the task force that deterrence 
of China is eroding. Uh, and, and that is not a good thing as well. And so we believe that the United States needs to take steps to, to restore the deterrent effect, if you will, to make sure that China doesn't think on any given day that it's a good idea to invade Taiwan or to take it militarily. That's a really critical step. The problem with that is because tensions are up to get into what I would call this rebalanced situation, steps mm -hmm. that the United States may take, tensions are going to go up even higher. That's why Biden and Xi have to be, get together on this and stay together on this so that whatever steps are taken, war doesn't break out. Well, as you said, you know, the tensions are rising um, and a big part of it is probably due to U.S. domestic politics. Um, our own domestic rhetoric uh, about China has not been uh, disciplined, I would say. Um, and as someone, you know, who's been through different uh, presidents and, you know, decades of uh, served in the U.S. government military for decades, um, is this just getting worse in terms of, you know, what maybe the, the administration um, would like to achieve? However, the public and the media uh, is not being helpful. You know, I, I would encourage and this is hard, but, but, but I would encourage those who listen to the rhetoric coming out of the United States to focus on what the administration says. Uh, I spent many, many years in government, the, you know, the last certainly decade plus in Washington. Uh, and there are, there's rhetoric coming from Capitol Hill on many issues, including this one. Uh, I have been struck, and it's not just in Ty about Taiwan. Globally, you know, an awful lot of people read what congressman or senator X, Y, or Z say and take it as policy. And that's just not the case. Uh, it, it is a fact, and it's, it makes solving this puzzle that much more difficult. You know, being opposed to China right now, being anti-China, is politically uh, very effective and, and, and positive, if you will, from the political perspective for politicians. So on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans. And so you're going to hear that rhetoric. Uh, I would ask that, you know, when you hear that rhetoric, not to react to it so heavily, because nine times out of 10, it really is just rhetoric and it's political rhetoric for their own constituents, for their own political gains, if you will, uh, certainly over the course of the next year. And in that regard, if it's if it's taken seriously, it could be very dangerous. It doesn't mean they don't have views, strong mm -hmm. views about China uh, in many areas. But at the same time, the policy, the real policy uh, yeah. and where the U.S. is right now is coming out of the White House. And I would pay attention to that. Well, thank you for explaining that, because I don't think most people uh, outside of even Washington, D.C., uh, would understand how to accurately uh, interpret what is the real U.S. policy. Um, I want to go back to uh, a key debate in Washington, D.C. about whether China will invade Taiwan or not. Some believe it entirely hinges on PLA's capabilities, the People's Liberation Army. Based on your experiences in other parts of the world, um, what's your view of capabilities and intent? So will Beijing invade Taiwan when the PLA is ready? And you mentioned the timeline 2027, which was put out by uh, the U.S. defense intelligence community. Um, do you believe in that timeline? When she, when I'm asked about an invasion in Taiwan from China, there's only one person on Earth that knows the answer to that question, and that's the president of China. That's Xi Jinping. So I, it's an unknown. Uh, I think uh, he's been pretty clear to tell his military, the PLA, to be ready by 2027. Clearly, the investment in in China in its defense department, in its defense capability, has uh, risen dramatically in the last couple of decades. So they're much more capable than they used to be. But but, but one of the realities of the world we're living in right now is the war in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and as someone who led our military during during a couple of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, this is really hard stuff. Rarely do we get it right. China hasn't fought a war, a significant war, really, since 1953, uh, even though there was one in Vietnam, you know, over a very brief yeah. period of time. So well, one of the things I believe, I mean, I don't know this, but I believe uh, that Xi Jinping and his uh, and his leadership team are looking at 
uh, what's going on in Ukraine and must be sobered uh, by what's happened so far, by the devastation that's there, that in Putin's case, it has gone so badly yeah. for him for lots of reasons. Uh, um, and, and to be very, I would be sitting there wondering how I would do. So these capabilities, uh, the, the the idea of an amphibious landing, if you will, in hey. Taiwan to literally seize the seize the island. It's the most complex military operation known to man. Uh, and, uh, and and so it will not be done easily. Uh, the, Thai, the Taiwanese defense capability is also increasing, very wary of what's going on with respect to China. And it's for all these reasons. And, and you know, we've talked in our report about the, the, the depression, the, the economic depression that would occur globally yeah. if there was a if there were a war in Taiwan. So everybody loses. It's not just China or the U.S. The globe loses you know, if war breaks out over Taiwan. That's why leaders, responsible leaders on every side of this question have to figure out uh, how to resolve this peacefully. It's absolutely critical that that happen. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, the consequences are going to be so great, um, much greater than the Ukraine-Russia war that uh, no one probably would take it easily, lightly. Um, but as we know, you know, most of the wars happen, uh, you know, better than anyone else, uh, not because of this, you know, clear cut, you know, I decide I am going to launch the war. Oftentimes it happens because of uh, accidents. And so uh, with both the U.S. led Western allies building of the defense and deterrence uh, to protect Taiwan and China doing the same, both in the name of defense rather than sort of you know, launching attacks. Um, what mechanisms need to be in place to make sure and prevent any potential accidents? Well, this issue le leads to the lack of communication between our military. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, recently, when uh, Secretary Austin was in Shangri-La and, and at least shook General Lee's hand, which I thought was positive, Mm. Uh, and somewhat that it, you know if that's where we are you know in, in being positive we got a long way to go but the my own experience is having the ability to pick up the phone and speak to each other uh, in a crisis uh does a great deal to make sure that crisis doesn't spin out of control there's a fairly long history here of china cutting off mill to mill this this last uh this last time it was cut off. It was as a result of uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit last year to Taiwan. Um, and, and I understand China doesn't want to do this because they don't want to, quote unquote, reward uh, the United States. For me, this is not about a reward. This is a necessity to make sure we don't go to war. Uh, and I recognize even when when we call each other, when communications are working, there has to be somebody there that can actually answer a question uh, and that can make a decision. And we both have our own chains of command. Yeah. Uh, and, and I understand that. But there needs to be, in a world that we're in right now, it needs to happen rapidly to making sure making sure we we de-escalate any situation. And China's recent actions, uh, where one ship came very close to another ship. Mm -hmm where a, a Chinese yeah. jet flew in front of one of our airplanes. Those are really dangerous yes. actions. I've spent a lot of time in my life in uh, in those kinds of situations. Yeah. And you have to have skilled people making sure something really doesn't turn bad and somebody doesn't get killed in that kind of situation. Clearly, China has been very aggressive in the South China Sea in the last several years, built it up militarily against what Xi Jinping said he would do. Mm -hmm. um, so tensions are way up, and I think will continue to be up. From my perspective, the U.S. isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, obviously, China is not going anywhere. So we need to figure out how to operate in that part of the world, you know, in a peaceful way without endangering lives. Establishing over a period of time, uh, you know, military to military communications to have these discussions, which we did throughout our time in the Cold War with the Soviets. We had multiple lines of communication open is really critical. That's a learning. I'm not trying to win here Yes. Uh, in terms of having communications. That's a learning from decades 
uh, of being in a Cold War with the Soviet Union. And it really does work. So I hope we can figure out a way to make that happen without the U.S. gloating, because we wouldn't do this, that we have now established communications or somehow we won. It really is critical. And if we don't have mill to mill, we've got to have some some other means of communication. Some maybe it's state, you know, maybe it's it's the you know the, the foreign ministry to the State Department, but some way of talking to each other rapidly yeah. to de-escalate a situation that could spin out of control and result in a big war. Well, you clearly agree that communication and um, just to be able to explain uh, to each other in terms of intent and with clarity is important. Um, but a major part of U.S. policy toward Taiwan is actually strategic ambiguity, uh, which is a long held U.S. policy toward Taiwan. Um, we know that the CFR task force couldn't come to a consensus on this point. Um, what is your view and can you kind of explain the various perspectives uh, that were presented in the report? Part of what the report uh, lays out, and I, again, I encourage people to read it, is, mm -hmm. is the rich history of the evolution uh, of this relationship and the policy. And I talked earlier about the context of it. Uh, and I think all of it kind of gets summed up. Uh, far too easily in is it is it uh, simplified is it yeah is it strategic ambiguity or strategic clarity yeah. i actually this is me personally i actually believe strategic ambiguity has worked we've had 40 plus years of peace uh, and i am loath to change that personally uh, mm -hmm. until i just have a compelling piece of evidence or a compelling situation that says look now's the time uh to, that we need to go to clarity i, I think i i just think as you said it's too it, we're we're trying to simplify it you know way too much and somehow that if we declare if we make it a strategic clarity you know that 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 just helps a great deal i i just don't believe that i think it complicates it i personally think it's a step toward yeah. war yeah, you know if we do that uh, and, and I recognize, you know, there are there are pros and cons to both sides of this. So and there was there wasn't significant disagreement. Admiral Harris was on the task force. He's been out publicly for for a couple of years now mm -hmm. advocating for strategic clarity. What I what we tried to do in the report in not addressing it was to downplay the significance of that decision, if you will, or that that policy and encourage people and you know people are busy and don't have time there's a lot of information here to try to understand what's really going on so i think people that it will continue to 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 advocate for one position or another i for one uh, think uh, it, you know strategic ambiguity has worked it has we have re retained or we've sustained a peaceful environment for over four decades uh and, and that's where i still am well, uh, most of your career was in the Middle East, uh, another region of its own complexity and difficulty. So looking at the Indo-Pacific today, are the challenges similar or different? And are there lessons learned from the Middle East that could be applied to the current deadlock across the Taiwan Strait? The, the one lesson from the Middle East that uh, that I take away is, is, is war is really tough. And mm. it doesn't oftentimes generate the outcomes that you want. So you need to be pretty careful about that. Uh, the Middle East, uh, again, I, I also learned that really those countries that live there have to resolve their own problems. We, we can support them in that regard, but um, that, that's really critical. And that's kind of where I am right now in terms of uh, even rising tensions uh, there as we speak. But the huge difference between indo pacom and and the Middle East is, uh, and I've said this for many years, you know, the, the indo pacom is the center of, four, of the four of the five largest economies in economies. the world. Uh, and again, it, and we've had peace and stability there for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and any outbreak of war in that part of the world is going to destabilize the world uh, almost instantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that requirement to keep it stable, I think, is a, is a compelling and overriding one for leaders of these countries. We also have alliances, longstanding alliances 
you know, the U.S. in that part of the world with Japan, with South Korea, yeah. with Australia. Uh, and, and in that regard, we have obligations there that are that are also longstanding. Uh, and our allies want to know what we're going to do. And you can see in Australia and Japan in particular, they are now publicly much more supportive uh, of stability in that region. Uh, and, and I wouldn't say they're willing to fight with us in the case of Taiwan, but certainly they're moving in that direction. They seek the kind of stability uh, that we've had uh, and are worried more and more about it, even as you see them build up uh, their own defense budgets. So it's the most important region in the world. It will be for you know decades to come. And it's on all of us as leaders to make sure we do everything we possibly can to make sure war does not break out. Well, uh, last question. Uh, as much as we all, you know, not want a war to break out, uh, but will it happen or not? Uh, well, you know very well, Graham Allison's Thuc Thucydus uh, trap destined for war yeah. between the US yeah. and China. And then you have Cameron Rudd's avoidable war. Which one do you believe? Um, I still think it's, uh, I, I think they've both framed the, <laughs> the range of possibilities, if you will. Uh, and uh, I think it's more than anything else. And both are, you know, I know I know both individuals mm -hmm. well, uh, and they're incredibly thoughtful individuals. Uh, I think more than anything else, not because either one of them have said this to me, what they have done is a service to tee up, if you will, the dangers uh, that exist with respect to where we are right now and to hopefully create thoughtful leadership globally, you know, on these issues uh, to try to understand them in some depth uh, and uh, and also to try to understand how dangerous this is. Uh, I, you know, I'm a kid of the 60s, if you will. I think it's the most dangerous time since 1962, honestly, which was the Cuban Missile Crisis here in the U.S. Um, uh, I would hope, for instance, and that was tied to nuclear weapons, uh, with uh, Soviet right. Union, I would hope we could get into a conversation with China uh, about nuclear weapons. They are developing that capability. Yes. It's an incredibly dangerous capability. Uh, and responsible powers historically, uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S. in particular, have engaged in treaties uh, since the early 70s, quite frankly, to contain these weapons. That's just one example. So we live in a very, very dangerous time uh, from my perspective. So I think what Rudd and, and Allison have done have framed it very well. It's on, all, it's, it's on all of us, including them, to speak to these issues in a way that educate so that leaders will make good decisions so that we don't have that conflict that, that, that could literally destroy the world. Well, thank you, Emeril, for uh, speaking to TVBS Meeting Room today and, of course, for um, co-chairing this report, which obviously is another tool of education uh, to the general public. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for your cautionary and wise words. Take thank care. You. Yeah.